Well, thank you to the panel for having me and for all of you for sticking with me, standing as I do between you and the wine. I will be mindful of my time. So I've prepared for you a paper about the great Scottish physician and father of tropical medicine, Sir Patrick Manson, but not Patrick Manson as you might know him. This is not Manson triumphant in the field, carrying out his experiments into mosquito uh, transmission of disease in late 19th century China. It's not Manson at the colonial office. Uh, it's not even Manson at the hospital, uh, namely the Albert Dock Hospital, where in 1899 he founded the London School of Tropical Medicine. No, I'd like to consider a bit more of a personal space. I'd like us to travel to 21 Queen Anne Street in London and visit Manson at home. Now, focusing on London, um, here in, in this context, a, a history prize in, in Scotland um, may seem a bit odd, yet in the first instance, at least, I can rely on the fact that Manson is arguably one of the most well-known Scottish doctors in history. Um, born in 1844 to a large family in Old Meldrum in Aberdeenshire, he studied at the University of Aberdeen and took summer sessions right nearby, the University of Edinburgh. He worked briefly in Durham uh, at an asylum before following his brother to China, where he was appointed medical officer to the Chinese Imperial Maritime Customs in 1866. Now, Scottish trained physicians were ideally placed to take up uh, the new medical posts in the growing British Empire. Indeed, with the uh, domestic medical market becoming increasingly competitive, many looked to imperial lands for their career opportunities. And Irish and Scottish doctors were disproportionately represented in the colonial services, accounting for about 60% of medical officers in the elite Indian medical service in the late 19th century. Um, and as uh, historian Mark Harrison demonstrates here, there's a consistently high proportion of IMS recruits graduating from Edinburgh across the Victorian era. So I think it would be fair to say that the British Empire ran on Scottish doctors. Um, so I'd like to suggest that the focus of this paper on Manson in London does nothing to undermine his importance in Scottish history. Indeed, I think it shows how deeply imbued Scottish history is within British history and importantly, imperial history. Now, when we think of medicine in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, I think most people would naturally imagine the laboratory or the hospital as the spatial terrain of, of the profession, or possibly even the hospital laboratory. Um, as French physician and physiologist Cla uh, Claude Bernard reflected in the middle of the 20th century, the true sanctuary of medical science is the laboratory. But what happens when you have a lab at home? Manson's home at 21 Queen Anne Street, just near prestigious Harley Street, demonstrates that we need to think more broadly about the spaces of science in the 19th century. Delving deeper into Manson's home, we can imagine it as a site of knowledge making, which disrupts the division between domestic, laboratory, social, and clinical spaces. Behind the doors of his five-story Georgian townhouse, Manson's domestic world was a site of encounter for imperial doctors, patients, and researchers, as well as animals, insects, and even microscopic parasites. In recent years, historians and geographers have interrogated the ways in which space is not a neutral backdrop for the events of history. Spaces are intimately connected with identity and power, influencing the nature and outcomes of interactions and knowledge making within them. This spatial turn has been particularly relevant for historians of empire and medicine, as well as geographers who study the home. Now, the home has been a crucial space of interest for historians of the 19th century. Um, it has been widely accepted that domesticity for middle-class Victorians was defined by a segregation of a family-centered home life and an economically productive work life in the outside world. However, more recently, scholars have challenged this idea of what they've called separate spheres. Uh, indeed, amongst the working and professional classes, including doctors and surgeons, the home was a hybrid space, mixing income earning activities and family life. From lowly dentists to high-powered London consultants, a home consulting room was a necessity for private practice. A closer look behind the doors of Manson's house shows that no easy lines can be drawn between the private and the professional, the social and the scientific. On the headings of letters, telegraphs, and meeting minutes, 21 Queen Anne Street appears as a forgotten character in Manson's story, and someone I'd like to introduce you to tonight. So I think the best way to tackle this particular subject is a, a bit of a tour through Manson's home. And the original building having been torn down in 1914, we're going to have to use our imagination slightly. Um, combining what we already know about the architecture of Georgian townhouses, as well as descriptions of Manson's home and family from surviving letters and archival documents. So this afternoon, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the, on the ground floor and also on the fifth floor, but also the interconnections between them. 
The ground floor contained Manson's private consulting room as well as the parlor where visitors would be received and the dining room where more intimate acquaintances would be invited. Um, we can skip over the intervening floors, lots of bedrooms and sitting rooms for the household. Yes, four floors of bedrooms and sitting rooms for Manson's enormous family of children, get grandchildren, and equally big domestic staff. Um, we arrived then on the fifth floor where Manson had constructed himself a laboratory, um, which was affectionately known by his family as the muck room. Um, so I think let's start there in the muck room. Um, described here from memory by his son-in-law, Philip Manson Barr, in the 1960s. He said there was a bench and his favorite microscope, slides and stains, but especially noticeable were the remarkable gadgets for microscope technique, which he had himself fashioned out of pieces of tin and wire. He invariably kept some live animals which harbored interesting parasites such as java sparrows, canaries, guinea pigs, and rats. He also had mosquito cages in which he bred these in for insects for larvae, thus acquiring as much knowledge of their biology and habits as was possible at that time. He would work there far into the night, devising new methods of staining and examining blood. Sometimes he never went to bed at all. And on many occasions, when led thither by his eldest daughter, he would escape to his muckroom once more. Um, as this passage indicates, the muckroom served as a hub for human, animal, and insect bodies, drawn into Manson's continued pursuit of the filarial worm as a vector for tropical disease. Uh, and here Manson is, shown um, in his muckroom in 1908. Um, it's the only photograph I've been able to identify of the interior of this space, uh, looking tantalizingly messy in the background there. The import importation and breeding of infected insects and animals made the top floor of Manson's home a veritable arc of tropical disease. Experimentation on live animals was common practice amongst physicians and scientists in the 19th century, and Manson had been using dogs, monkeys, and birds as incubators for parasites since his days in China. Monkeys could be found as pets in the Manson home, which doubling uh, effectively as research subjects. Uh, he once wrote to a collaborator working in Africa, asking him to investigate cases of the disease Einhum. Uh, it's a condition in which the fifth toe spontaneously wastes away. Um, and this is because his wife's pet monkey seemed to have been afflicted with the disease, and he needed more research material to develop a sensible course of treatment. Other exotic animals uh, were simply pets, like uh, Manson's creatively named parrot, Polly Manson, um, who was remembered for insulting visitors as well as patients in a broad Scottish accent. Uh, or when the family relocated to Ireland in 1914, a pet alligator whose eggs were served for breakfast. Um, as his main research interest was vector-borne parasites, Manson kept a constant stock of insects infected or awaiting infection for experiments carried out at home. Through these investigations, the top floor of 21 Queen Anne Street became quite literally a petri dish of imperial medicine, bringing together tropical disease with the British environment. Um, in a famous experiment, Manson mixed water from Wandsworth Ponds in London, and which contained the water flea Cyclops, with a guinea worm he'd extracted from a patient at the Albert Dock Hospital and brought home with him. Um, after 24 hours, guinea worm embryos were able to be identified inside the newly infected fleas. Um, Manson was so thrilled with his discovery, he wrote immediately to Ronald Ross, um, illustrating the newborn parasite uh, there in the margins for you. Um, Manson also had a constant supply of mosquitoes, um, imported or domestic, living and dead, um, which formed the basis for his experiments into the transmission of malaria. In 1895, he wrote to Ross of a plan to import mosquitoes from Gibraltar and then allow them to, quote, bite the first malaria case I can lay hands on. Um, he prepared a breeding chamber um, in, in the muckroom and then told his collaborator he lacked only the patient to complete the experiment. Um, luckily for Manson, but perhaps unluckily for his family, his home also proved a good resource for human research subjects. Um, he wrote to Italian physician Angio Celli in April 1900 and that he intended to import into England from Rome malaria-infected mosquitoes, setting them to bite Englishmen in London. This would be incontrovertible proof that the mosquito can convey the germ for malaria. A special cage, which you can see here, was filled with infected mosquitoes and dispatched by a special messenger from Italy to London. The mosquitoes were then allowed to bite Patrick Thurburn Manson, then a 23-year-old student following his father into medicine. In an article titled Malaria, an Experiment, the younger Manson reported his personal experience of the disease in detailed hour-by-hour -hour descriptions. Manson's daughter, Edith, was on hand to take careful note of her brother's progress as she was training to be a nurse at the time. Manson took blood samples from his son to show the success of the infection before treating him with quinine. Uh, the laboratory space then can be seen as spreading out into the house, drawing people in from the supposedly isolated areas into the laboratory. At 21 Queen Anne Street, the divide between scientific and family was decidedly blurred. 
Furthermore, the location of this research had a found effect on the kinds of experiments we can see Manson carrying out. Um, undertaking such a bold and risky experiment, um, obtaining the willing cooperation of a subject through the bonds of filial trust, and the course of the disease carefully monitored within the comfortable setting of the home under the watchful eye of his sister. Moving now back down to the ground floor of the home, we come to Manson's private consulting room. Um, while having a laboratory at home was a rare occurrence in the late 19th century, practicing medicine at home certainly was not. Um, as historian Anne Digby has, ex Digby has explored sorry, in her economic history of doctoring, the possession of a corner or double-fronted house with a surgery entrance was a must for a 19th century physician. Manson's consulting rooms were located on the ground floor of his home, easily accessible from the street. And inside, Manson had created an exotic atmosphere reminiscent of his Eastern experience. His son-in-law describes it thus. On the ground floor of 21 Queen Anne Street, approached by a dark passage, was Manson's consulting rooms. It had a distinctly oriental appearance, an impression strengthened by Manson himself, who in the gloom would have passed for a Chinese Mandarin. He sat at a large table, which together with the surrounding walls was decorated with pictures and photographs of many his many triumphs, as well as character, caricatures of his colleagues, um, of which uh, this is one. Um, unlike the modern clinical spaces in which Manson spent most of his time in hospital practice, his private practice was dark, exotic, and fashionable. Manson saw patients every morning until about midday before rushing off to his hospital practice. He would then take appointments again in the evening upon his return, his wife and daughters acting as unofficial secretaries to balance the load of the casework. As Manson's career progressed, his home and, private pra uh, his home and hospital practice were increasingly intermixed. Patients would arrive at Manson's home for testing, but if the case proved serious, would be referred on to the Albert Dock Hospital for further observation. Given his reputation as an expert in tropical diseases, it's hardly surprising that his private practice was dominated by colonial officers and their wives. Reporting on the case of Mrs. R, aged 31, who sought out Manson as a private patient in 1905, Manson recorded how he was able to identify the dreaded trypanosomes characteristic of sleeping sickness in her blood before quickly referring her onward to treatment at the Doc Hospital. In the late 19th century, being a physician wasn't only clinical, though. It also had many important social aspects. Indeed, as Digby has observed, social attributes mattered almost as much as medical skill in creating a successful private practice. Manson's prestige as a researcher and a practitioner resulted in Queen Anne Street becoming a busy social space. Ronald Ross remarked that Manson was always followed by a horde of admiring doctors. However, social and professional networks intermingled when individuals came with a valuable parasitic cargo for researchers like Manson. Writing to Philip Manson Bar in September 1910, um, Edith Manson recalled a dinner party at home with Dr. Rowe, um, who has just come back from West Africa full of something in his blood, and father is very impressed. A dinner party becomes a research opportunity. Social networks overlap the professional. Did Manson run upstairs to fetch his trusty microscope <laughs> to take a sample? Was a wriggling parasite revealed through the lens for the enjoyment of other dinner guests? Did Dr. Rowe come back for a private consultation the next day? Um, unfortunately, as with much research carried out in domestic spaces, these fleeting encounters are very rarely recorded. However, we can safely assume this was far from an unusual occurrence in the Manson household. As Manson's work and theories began to attract other medical men, patrons, and patients, Queen Anne Street was naturally transformed into a hub for what was to become the London School of Tropical Medicine, established in 1899. Philip Manson Barr described the house as the nucleus of the future London school and arguably its functioning heart in its early years. Even after the foundation of the school in the Docklands, Manson's home would continue to be the location of choice for committee meetings. The medical council of the Albert Talk Hospital first sat in 1899 at 21 Queen Anne Street, moving only occasionally to the medical society rooms, just a convenient walk away. From 1900, these meetings were held exclusively at Manson's home until his retirement. Between 1899 and 1903, the school committee met a total of 37 times, 29 of these at Queen Anne Street. I think we can possibly sense a, a desire amongst the clinicians to avoid the lengthy trip out to the London deep docks. Now, to what extent were these different internal spaces of the home gendered? Um, his wife and daughters in particular appear to be transgressing any internal divisions between domestic and scientific, serving as unpaid nurses, secretaries, administers, uh, administrators, and even translators. Um, his eldest daughter, Edith, as I mentioned, trained as a, as a nurse at the Royal London Hospital, and she worked very closely with her father, often writing his research notes and letters. Yet they also served uh, an important role as guardians of the, the Victorian ideals of domesticity, hosting dinners, entertaining guests, and keeping up family relations. Manson's son-in-law, Philip, recalled that the great physician generally preferred to lock himself away, leaving the ladies of the household to look after the many scientific, medical, and political dignitaries who visited the house. 
With his expanding family and network of research contacts, his, family, uh, his female relations also carried out the work of maintaining relationships across the vast expanses of empire. Through their unpaid toil, his wives and daughters helped to assure Manson's professional and social success. So from the dining room to the laboratory, Patrick Manson's pursuit of his medical research infiltrated almost every aspect of his domestic life. Internal divisions between 21 Queen Anne Street helped to organize the hybrid space, providing different areas for consulting, socializing, dining, family life, and research. Um, but as we've seen, these lines were constantly being transgressed by Manson, his family, patients, and colleagues, uh, to say nothing of exotic pets and imported insects. Um, it's a shame that such an important place um, in the history of medicine has now been lost. Um, we can see here Manson's blue pla plaque at 50 Welbeck Street, um, where he lived only very briefly uh, after moving out of Queen Anne Street and relocating to Ireland. What I've tried to suggest here this evening is that the hospital and the field were far from the only places in which Manson encountered tropical diseases and imperial patients. His home must be considered formative for his research and the development of tropical medicine in this period. Queen Anne Street, sheltered somewhat from the public eye, allowed Manson to pursue more ambitious experiments, have more confidential conversations, and to develop his informal networks with colleagues and visitors. Its unique position as a hybrid domestic, clinical, and research space reminds us we need to think more inclusively about the spaces in which science occurred and medical knowledge was made in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who has questions? Uh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I was curious, you mentioned briefly that the lab was quite rare for the time period. Mm -hmm. Is there any indication of how other doctors or colleagues that he worked with found this unusual space or if they felt it was strange to be working in a home mm -hmm. environment? I, I don't know if they found it strange, but I think they found it exciting. Um, certainly Manson seems to always have people around him in the laboratory. Um, and I'm sort of, I allude to a little bit this idea that sort of different kinds of conversations are able to happen at home. So we know people like um, Lord Lister, Joseph Lister, get invited into the space. Th they'll be shown things, sort of a, a private preview in the lab, and he'll then, you know, when he then goes out and is sort of sharing his experiments, he's already built kind of a foundation of, of kind of ascent amongst the scientific community. Um, so I think it's, it's a space that was unusual but very attractive to the people around him. Um, I think the other point is that Manson comes back to London very late in his career. He doesn't have the same kind of established hospital presence that a lot of other consultants do. Um, so while other practitioners of his level kind of have established relationships at a hospital or in a, path, a pathology lab, he, he comes a bit cold. And so he has to make that environment for himself. I mean, especially until he's able to develop something um, at the Albert Dock. But even then, he prefers, I mean, it's easier at home, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, one of the things that one participates in are things like clinical trials and mm. colleagues keep you in check. Mm. And the enthusiasms of an individual are partly kept in check by the colleagues, either through um, wisdom or perhaps um, envy or whatever. So this guy, you know, the idea of stepping across the ethical bounds, mm. you know, escaping mosquitoes, infecting his son, mm. carrying out experiments and, and doing... Um, you know, mm. is, is quite an interesting thought. Do you know, did anything terrible happen? Or did, did or? <laughs> um, no. Uh, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one, because of course we know that 19th century doctors and surgeons experimented a lot on, the, on their patients and themselves with or without any kind of consent. Um, and actually, Patrick Thurburn Manson, the younger Manson, does die, but not, not from that. Uh, he's, he's off on a research mission, I think, in Java. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to note, though, that he's carrying out these experiments at home, as you say, he's willing to sort of work with his son, but he writes a letter to Ross telling him he must, under no circumstances, experiment on himself. He's too important to science to risk it. Um, which I feel, I, I mean, like, it feels ironic that he would say something like that. I don't know if he's maybe kind of performing that, sort of emphasizing Ross's importance, but clearly it was understood between them that self-experimentation and their malaria experience was, was something that you assumed was probably going to happen at some point. Yeah. Okay, time for one more, if anybody has one more. No, all right, thank you very much, Kristen. <laughs> 